Greetings, students, and welcome to this special edition of the Professor Travel Domestic Edition. I am your host, the Professor Travel, coming to you from Southern California. This is the website, the vlog, and the podcast that you come to in order to be notified and learn more about different travel destinations. Hopefully, you will come together as a community in order to discuss more. We hope this will also inspire you to travel more and ultimately to enjoy life more. Now, you can reach me on a variety of different social media platforms, including but not limited to my website, which is at theprofessortravel.com. I am also available on YouTube, Facebook, and now on TikTok at The Professor Travel. If you're an Instagrammer, you can find me there at the underscore professor underscore travel. If you're a Twitter -er -er -er, then you can find me on Twitter at The Professor TR1. And if you're a blogger, you can find me on Blogspot at theprofessortravel.blogspot.com. Today, I am so pleased to introduce you to one of my visiting professors and a, and a friend of mine from childhood, Walter McManigal. How are you doing, sir? Hey, how's it going, man? <laughs> Good. Great seeing you again. We haven't seen each other probably in at least 20 years. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a hot minute. It has been a hot minute. You've been traveling all over the States and you know, you've got a lot under your belt. Uh, but for the benefit of my students who may not know a little bit about you, maybe you could share a little bit about your credentials, maybe some of your either educational background or places that you've traveled before. Oh, sure. Yeah. I, uh, like I said, I, like you said, I grew up with you in California. Um, and right after I turned 21, 22, I decided, you know what? I needed to further my career and I was offered a job opportunity in Nebraska and Lincoln, Nebraska. So I took it and I ended up computer programming there for a good four years before I decided, you know what? I don't want to live in a cubicle anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> that's when I decided to go back to school and they, you have a great university there. So I spent the next uh, almost two decades living in Nebraska, um, working and living and meeting my wife, having my kids, uh, before eventually moving on to warmer climates. So well, awesome. yeah, I know and a thing or two been, about Nebraska. And you've been, and you've been to a, you've been outside the United States too, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've been to Europe. Um, I've been out to the Pacific. I've been to Australia and New Zealand. I like to travel. Travel is fun. It's very good. It's so great to meet new people too. Like someone with a different perspective than, you, than your own. It's, it's awesome. I find traveling very therapeutic. I wish we could do more this year. Unfortunately, with COVID, it's been a little bit of a strain on us all. So that's no, been that's been a challenge absolutely. for us. Absolutely. Um, but as you were alluding, the nature of this specific vlog and podcast is going to be directed at this great state of Nebraska, uh, where you'd been for quite some time. So I know I, I really don't know that much about the great state of Nebraska, apart from where it's kind of located, but for the benefit of the students and for myself, maybe you can share a little bit of your knowledge with us in terms of, let's start with a little bit of history. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Nebraska wasn't in a state for a long time. It was actually a territory and it was fought over by the, by the Spain, Spanish and the French. Uh, ultimately, they were forced to sell uh, as part of a purchase to the United States. And at that point, it became a territory. Um, and there was a lot of movement going on of expansion during that time in the 1800s. So a lot of, a lot of Native Americans were, were pushed out, unfortunately, during that time last settlement was going on because they were I've, if you've heard of the great land grant right mm -hmm. yeah where they were just giving away land because they wanted people to settle and to to expand the territory of the united states so it was like claim staking basically right it, exactly it was it was organized claim staking because they would literally have a line and be lining everyone up and say around your market set go and then and markers and wherever marker you got that was your going to be your land but that's just yeah, that was just insane that that happened. Uh, but there were also tribal wars and things like that that occurred within the area too back in that time, correct? Oh, absolutely. It wasn't just settlers and uh, Native Americans. Native Americans were also territorial. And uh, like the Lakota and the Sioux, uh, they would be at warfare with each other over water rights, over cattle, or not necessarily cattle, I should rephrase that, bison because bison lived on the plains during that time. And so there was a lot of fighting going on for resources to mm. live. Excellent. You know? And any recent history in the last maybe 50 years that are uh, of any significance that pop out to you? Well, I mean, Nebraska 
is home to Offutt Air Force Base. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but when there is a, a disaster or a, a, a national emergency, for example, when 9-11 happened, the president was flown in to Offutt Air Force Base because it was considered one of the safest spots in the United States to be mm, during was not that aware time that. because they don't because terrorists were attacking us and we didn't know where they were going to strike who they were going to hit but no one would think about nebraska so there there's actually a safety spot there i mean I, maybe i should be telling all this information there's plenty of <laughs> there's plenty of places that the president could go but there's a lot just, yeah there are other <laughs> yeah it's, it's not just us colorado has norad and things of that nature but often air force base is where president bush was flown into and protected well, thank you for sharing all that with us. Talk to us a little bit about the geography of the area. Um, uh, for example, Absolutely. where, like, I, I know there are plains. I, I, there aren't a lot of mountainous areas except for where you get towards the Rocky Mountain side of Nebraska, which is like just on the west western side, correct? Yeah. So, so the way Nebraska is set up is it's actually a by uh, geographic location, and what I mean by that is on one side of the divide there's rolling hills and lots of um, lots of sloping plains, like very hilly, right? And that's the eastern side of the state. On the western side of the state is like the high plains, more of an arid type um, geography. So it's not as humid. Technically, the eastern side is considered uh, subtropical, and there's okay. actually a lot of moisture and humidity going on. Whereas the western side is going to be a little more drier, it's more arid, it's like a high plains sort of climate. And that's also where the sand hills are, which is like huge, just rolling grasslands, just coming through, growing up through the sand. Well, talk to me a little bit more about the sand hills, because I'm not really familiar with that, but I guess it's a big travel destination. Uh, absolutely. The sand hills is actually one of the most remote places in all of the United States. And a lot of stargazers travel there. It's like a mecca. People go there because there's no light bleed. So if you want to get a great photograph of the Mecca, that's where you go. You go to the sand hills because there's no lights anywhere. So you get the whole expanse of the Milky Way across the sky and you get wonderful, beautiful pictures out there. Excellent. I, although I imagine they, they just, they, they do not encourage flash photography. <laughs> so uh, no, nor headlights in cars. Okay. <laughs> you know, you, you, you got to turn those off and you get in there. You're going to get yelled at by somebody. <laughs> Um, talk to me a little bit also about the states that border Nebraska. What are the states that you're aware of that border the area? Absolutely. So uh, right directly to the north is South Dakota, and that pretty much runs across the entire border. Okay. To the west, you got on the northwest is Wyoming, and on the southwest is Colorado. Okay. Directly to the south is Kansas, and then to the east is Iowa. Okay. And then in the very southeast corner, it actually touches Missouri. Oh, it does. Okay. I was it like, does. I thought there's, a, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting when you find out how many states border one specific state, but it's also surrounded too. So that's, that, that leads to a huge amount of, uh, you know, bleed over where you have different people going from state to state for different types of reasons. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, especially when we get into things like entertainment and stuff like that too. Uh, but, but let's talk about weather for a second, because oh. you have, okay. <laughs> you and I grew up in Southern California. I didn't oh, yes. have a problem with earthquakes and, and, you know, earthquakes to us are like water from a drinking fountain. It's like, eh, it happens. And there's nothing really huge. Like we may get one every so often, but I've, I've always been a little bit concerned about the wind coming and throwing my house around. Uh, in fact, we had a, we had a, we had an issue we were just talking about before the recording started um, where um, I had gone over to, I had gone over to your house when we were teenagers and we had a massive, what we thought was windstorm that we thought it actually, I, I think the news determined it was a water spout that touched down nearby, um, uh, which was just insane because we never get that in Southern California. But in Oklahoma, or not in Oklahoma, I'm sorry, but in Nebraska, you'll often from time to time see tornadoes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tornadoes are a way of life there. And it's funny that you say it, but about earthquakes is because you know who Nebraskans, you know what Nebraskans are afraid of? What's that? Earthquakes. Why? <laughs> they, they are definitely afraid of earthquakes because it's unnatural for the ground to move like that and to possibly knock down a house and break things, you know? Mm -hmm. No, but, you know, tornadoes, it's just, it's just a way of life there because you have to understand geography plays a part in this where you got the high mountains of the Rockies on the left-hand side and that wind starts coming down and funneling down into that plains and picks up speed. Well, then it hits a subtropical type of... Uh, of 
of climate. And that's when it starts to mix. That's when it starts to brew. And that's when things like really nasty hurricanes can touch down and hit. Grand Island got almost leveled um, back. Oh, really? In the, yes, back in the uh, late 80s, I believe. There was a huge tornado that came down and pretty much tore up most of the town, caused lots of death. Um, and things like that happen. Do I most mean, of the places I, have storm cellars there? Oh yeah, I mean they they do, but you have to understand that there's also a lot of people that live in trailers or that don't, uh, for whatever reason, they're like an apartment complex that doesn't have a cellar, mm-hmm. you know. And if a if a Category Five hurricane comes through, or not hurricane, tornado comes through, it's that's it's going to be like boys, it's just going to blow apart, yeah. you know. And the pressure that's the thing that's what most people don't understand is it's the wind pressure, is it produces so much pressure inside, it's almost like an implosion. Oh, wow. And uh, and actually, believe it or not, I I witnessed a tornado that jumped over the city of Lincoln. Uh, I was at work one day and they were warnings started going off sirens. And so we were all curious because we didn't have a cellar. Right. And uh, my place at work. So we just decided to peek our heads outside and everything was yellow. I mean, you look across the street to the building over, it looked yellow. There was it was just a solid yellow state. Everything was quiet no birds were chirping no animals nothing it was deathly still deathly quiet and you know when it gets quiet that's the calm right before the storm hits so literally we went, okay time to go inside let's go lock ourselves in the in the in the back room and hope for the best <laughs> and uh luckily like i said the tornado had touched down just outside the city and because the, the theory is lincoln is actually in a basin Mm-hmm. the theory was that it actually jumped the basin because okay. the heat the heat from all the rising up from the city and stuff like that kind of pushed it up and helped it jump over but apparently it touched down again on the other side of the city so, yeah so during that time it was like right overhead <laughs> uh, no i i'm I, yeah i'm uh, i'm a little taken aback by some of that stuff so oh, i'm, it, I'm, it was, I'm glad we creepy. at least discuss it yeah um okay so let's talk a little bit about the culture of nebraska um i'm curious for your interaction and knowledge with the religious community within the state of nebraska can you tell me a little bit about that yeah absolutely um uh, most of the state i believe about 60 percent is protestant okay and another 30 percent is catholic and okay. the rest is just smaller mormons um and you know other other religious entities but okay in the in the major cities like in lincoln and omaha uh catholic catholicism is actually pretty darn big in the rest of the state it's almost all protestant what about in terms of the native american population is would you say they uh they practice uh native native religions and, and belief systems as well correct Correct. Correct. Yeah. And that's mostly, though, that you have to understand that that's on the reservations. And quite honestly, there isn't a lot of interaction. I mean, there's some commerce, but there's not a lot of interaction between um, residents on a uh, on a from the cities and for with the reservations. I mean, there really isn't. I mean, it's mostly rural folk that will have dealings with uh, the reservations. But when you go to the cities, it's just like, it's all, it doesn't exist. Hmm. You know, it's really interesting how the dynamic plays out. Interesting. Okay. What about in terms of art in the the community? I usually tend to think of the fine arts as being things like painting, sculpting, um, expression through dancing and things like that. Obviously, uh, some acting as well. You have... um, uh, Fred Astaire and uh, Marlon Brando, both having having lived and were born in Nebraska, but uh, any other famous celebrities that I would have known about or should know oh, about? Absolutely. Uh, Alexander Payne is a major Hollywood director, and he grew up and he was influenced by Nebraska, which is why a lot of his films take place in, in Nebraska. In, in fact, mm-hmm. I even helped on one of his films. Did uh, you now? Up, up in the air up in the air was they shot some scenes in Omaha and I was basically just a hired grip and I was basically running errands for them while they were shooting that show. Very and nice. Then, uh, also, I don't know if you ever heard of the Tommy Lee back to school, you know, that rocker. Tommy yeah. Lee? From, from Motley Crue. From Motley Crue. He did a television show that I was uh, uh, and a production assistant on and I did B camera for them too in some certain spots. Um, and that was in the city of Lincoln. 
and they we ran around the city and he got to do a halftime show with a, during a football game and it was it was crazy and it was all reality tv that of course you know just because it's unscripted doesn't mean they say hey you should do this hey you should do that you know <laughs> but but yeah i mean there's been a lot of famous people that have kind of come in in and around and through uh nebraska and I believe it or not, there the art scene there is really nice. They're, they have got a number of museums. They've got a number of art installations. Um, the last one I remember was a bicycle installation where the they had these all these artists from the city and they they installed uh, I think it was like forty or fifty bicycles throughout the city that are a permanent like stuck into the ground. Um, and they were all they were all painted differently or done in a different style. Like one person had like pedals for spokes instead of real tires and mm. things like that. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so was, would you say it's it mostly modern art or is it a mix of classic and modern arts? Uh, classic and modern, modern art. I mean, there, the, there's, um, there's a lot of, um, like I said, like installations, but the museums are also things you wouldn't think of. For example, the National Roller Skating uh, Museum is link in Lincoln, Nebraska, hmm. and that is that tells you the history of roller skating. Um, and, Interesting. And on, then there's also um, theatrical. A lot of it is tied to um, the university. Obviously, they like to bring in artists and things like that. Um, but yeah, there's there's shows that travel through there. I mean, not so much this year, I'm sure, but. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they, they've pride themselves on their theatrical culture. I think I would also be remiss if I didn't mention uh, how Mutual of Omaha has sponsored things like Wild Animal Kingdom for many years. And that's that on its own has been a production value and a learning experience, but also an entertainment experience in, in terms of the arts. Um, mm. So it's an investment. I mean, yeah, it's an absolutely. investment. And same with Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway. They they also sponsor things and they, they bring things in. And same with TD Ameritrade which, you know, just merged. Um, but yeah, they, they, um, they love the arts and they love to, to, to bring culture in and, and let people experience it there. Excellent. Now, in terms of the language, uh, I think we've pretty much settled that mostly it's English and then there's just a smattering of native tongues, but there's also some Spanish uh, that also is spoken within the state as well. Um, mostly and it's sporadic depending upon the workers and depending upon the city size and things like that correct and the populations yeah yeah but the english there you have to understand is is it's not west coast it's not east coast the way they describe it is it's tv talk so it's like an, a tv anchor how they <laughs> speak that's how most nebraskans speak now really? when you get to the older population that's when you start to hear just that little bit of twang that comes in there. It's not quite Texas twang, but it's Nebraska. It's the way they say things. For example, the city of Tecumseh, and it's it's very overpronounced. Uh, and uh, Tecumseh. Tecumseh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it's interesting. Like, it, you, and you'll catch it every once in a while. And you'll just be like, did I just hear that right? Yeah. Okay. I'm just gonna <laughs> get it. Yeah, I did. And that's that's how you know if you know the true Nebraskans, you know. Very cool. Um, now, in terms of my, my favorite topics now, let's jump into food. Um, oh, yes. Home of the Reuben. Home of the Reuben mm -hmm. and a couple of different things I have on the screen here. Can you tell me a little bit about what we're seeing here? Absolutely. Um, so the yellow cup and the yellow uh, fries, that is Runza. Runza. And Runza is a implant food from Czechoslovakia. Okay. The Runza sandwich is a minced meat, uh, onion, and spice mixture that's stuffed into a uh, like a phyllo dough. Well, not not necessarily a phyllo dough. It's a it's a baked dough, mm -hmm. and it's eaten literally like like a hot dog, right? But it's completely surrounded by bread. The whole thing. It's just stuffed bread. It's like it's like a it's like a like a meat dough, it's a dough balls. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's an elongated dough ball. <laughs> and it's filled with meat and spices and cabbage and it is quite delicious they serve it piping hot you gotta Great. have it piping hot good for a and, cold uh, day you know, oh absolutely and they're also uh they're huge with like you said the reuben mm -hmm. so sauerkraut plays a part and they put it on their pizza sauerkraut on your pizza sauerkraut on your pizza wow it's actually you should give it a try I, you know i might just do that i think it is no and you know what? it adds a sweetness to it 
I think it's one of those things where it's just kind of a, a little bit of an unexpected thing. Like when I went to France uh, one time, I had a uh, pizza that had a fried egg on it, and I'm not used to seeing that. But it's one of those things that you know it's part of the culture, and if, okay. it, it's it's a big thing in the in several of the European locations. I, I actually saw that when I was in uh, Italy as well. So. I just assume there's yeah, you don't, you don't know until you try, right? Exactly. And, you know, even if you don't like it, at least you tried it once. So good for you on, you know, putting it, putting it down and giving it a shot. So, yeah, that's one thing I find, you know, with all the countries I've been to, I really enjoy the different types of flavors, the culture, the history, um, all the things that are associated with that type of community. But in the same, same way, I'm learning to appreciate them more and more with the states that we have here in the U S. So again, Thank you for sharing well, this place with us. Absolutely. You also have, um, to, I should shout out too that Godfather's Pizza originated and their headquarters is in Nebraska. Oh yeah. In, Om- in Omaha. And uh, they're a big Midwest uh, pizza chain that maybe people on the coast don't know about. Um, but uh, yeah, Godfather's Pizza is pretty big. And Mr. Good Sense is kind of also in that whole area. They do sub sandwiches. Okay. Um, yeah, there, there are a number of chains that the coasts might not even know exist, but they exist there in the Midwest, especially in Nebraska. Awesome. Very cool. Then in terms of sports and recreation, when it, when it comes to sports teams, no real professional teams, but the college team sets is very, very much up and active, especially with the Huskers. Um, Cornhuskers are a huge oh, yeah. thing, obviously. Um, it's all about the Huskers. So here's, here's a fun fact. During game days the Memorial Stadium where the Cornhuskers play on a game day, they say, and it, they're, it's true, it becomes the third largest city in Nebraska. Just the stadium. <laughs> Just because they're, they packed in so many people all of a sudden. 80,000 people. 80 plus thousand people. That's, yep. that's, that's an insane size. But that's I mean, the, hey, it's one of those things that if it's, a, if it's a draw once per year, it's almost like it's almost like a holiday on its own, just going to <laughs> this pilgrimage of getting to the to the location so they also have the longest uh sellout streak in all of college football continuous so and i guess this year is an aberration because they're not allowing students but uh but their audiences exactly exactly but you know the the numbers of people signing on to watch it online are pushing that number even bigger than what would normally fill a stadium so there that's good there's that interaction though that's that's really helpful. Um, then, in terms of holidays uh, for the state, uh, you were making mention to me that there there actually is a notable holiday that started in Nebraska. Can you tell me a little yeah. bit about that? They are the, the home of Arbor Day, and specifically uh, Columbus, uh, Nebraska. I'm sorry, Nebraska City, uh, down in the southeast corner of the state, is the home of Arbor Day. And I think a lot of it has to do is because there's not a lot of trees in Nebraska. When you get down to that southeast corner, you start to see more trees. So they're very proud of that, of that tradition of having Arbor Day as their day. And, and Arbor Day was days. really more of a um, conservation so, holiday about celebrate. that whole process. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a celebration. And, and yeah, exactly. Excellent. Yeah. Well, since we make mention of the population and population size, especially as it relates to sports, Let's talk about the size of the state. Um, do we know about what the population is in the great state of Nebraska? Um, yeah, I believe of the last, um, what was it? The, the last census, I don't think they've actually put those numbers together, but um, the population is right about 2 million. 2 million, okay. Uh, 2 million, and uh, Omaha takes up a large chunk of that. It's about almost 500,000 people. And that's this large right there. location. And by the way, if you are not seeing this uh, because you're on the podcast, you are f- free to go over to the YouTube channel in order to be able to see this. Um, so here on the Eastern side, we're seeing Omaha right there. And then we see a couple other population centers around it. Mm-hmm. That's in, is right there. And that's the capital. Uh, interesting story about that. Coming back to history a little bit. Mm-hmm. Omaha was actually designated the capital of Nebraska. And the people in Lancaster County, which is where Lincoln was, were not happy about that because they said, no, it should be away from the river. It should be away from all that commerce going on over there. So one night in the dead of night, they snuck in, stole the charter from the courthouse and brought it to Lincoln. And it's been there ever since. And so Lincoln became the capital. And 
it was actually called uh, Lancaster, but they, once they became the capital, they renamed it to Lincoln to honor uh, Abraham Lincoln, the recently okay. assassinated president. So basically, it was a large game of capture the flag to bring it over. <laughs> Absolutely, Lancaster. Absolutely. That's that's how Lincoln got its its name and its reputation. Is that we'll just take what we want. Okay. And then what's this other little population center that's over on the western side? Scotts Bluff. That's Scotts Bluff. Named after you, yes. Oh, clearly, yes. Thank <laughs> clearly, you. Yes. <laughs> Appreciate yeah, no, that. Scotts Scotts Bluff is. Um, it's very spread out, a little more rural town, not like a major big city, but there's a lot of commerce that goes there and there's a lot of thoroughfare and it's right off of uh, I-80, which is the main thoroughfare through the state that cuts the state uh, east to west. Okay. It's the main, main interstate that goes through. Perfect. Now, in terms of the various different types of economy and commerce and, and hiring that goes on within the state, obviously Berkshire Hathaway, one of the largest employers, as we, and same with Union Pacific. Um, Oh, yes. Hewitt, yes. Um, Kabbalah, uh, who else is in there? Uh, Werner Enterprises, uh, West Communications, uh, Valmont, Buckle, Mutual of Omaha, of course. Uh, any larger companies that I've potentially forgotten on this list? Uh, you got most of them there. Um, Kiwit, uh, you have Kiwit up there. Yeah. Um, Godfather's Pizza is located there. Uh, and Agunza is a big, they hire a lot of people and the university system is huge. Yeah. And that's a big, big hiring thing. There's a ton of people that work for the university. Uh, but yeah, for the most part, you, you're going to see other big companies there. For example, PayPal has a huge center in Omaha uh, and they do that. Yahoo has a presence there. Um, most major companies are starting to realize that, Hey, there's cheap land. We mm -hmm. can get a great building for practically nothing. We have cheap fairly cheap labor. We don't have to pay them the East Coast or the West Coast prices. Why wouldn't we want to come here? People are knowledgeable, the good school system here. Let's go bring a business in and we're, they're fairly business friendly. They want, you know, business to come in. So you're going to, it's actually been growing out there by these bigger companies, the tech companies that were starting to come in. And you're going to see more of that, I think in the next decade, you're going to see way more tech companies going into that area and it's going to blow up pretty quick. I have a feeling. Yeah, actually there are a number of companies that are leaving the Silicon Valley area of Southern Cal of California to move over to the middle of the United States. I know Texas is a big recipient of a lot of those. And I think Arizona, Nevada, Arizona, well. Nevada. Um, yeah, exactly. So we're seeing a lot of that moving out of the state uh, because of exactly as you're saying uh, the prices within the state, uh, the costs of living within the state. Just, I mean, if, if they're going to be honest, it's not, it, it's, it's not necessarily the organizations uh, having to define themselves by the amount they pay. They pay fairly good. It's just a, a central point. And I live in California. I love California. And you used to live here in California too, but the cost of living here in California is a little bit unbearable sometimes. So, yeah. So let me, let me tell you about that. So when I moved to Nebraska in 97, I was paying uh, about $260 in car insurance when I was in California. When I moved to Nebraska, I believe I paid $68 <laughs> for my car insurance. That'll tell you something right there, like <laughs> a fifth of what I was paying for, uh, in California. And that's the kind of cost savings that these companies and people that move to Nebraska find out. They realize, wait a minute, my quality of life may not be like, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars but it's pretty darn good for the buck you yeah. know because it's it's easy living you know that is of course Some, if you can deal with the tornadoes though and the winters because the winters there are brutal sometimes they can be very bad is it primarily <laughs> the um wind chill factor oh absolutely my first year there believe it or not um the actual temperature hit negative 20 i believe with the wind chill is negative 60 my car froze i couldn't start it it was completely frozen. I don't even know what I would do in that type of situation. Yeah, my heater in my small apartment could keep up. So I went to bed wearing a full coat and a robe and about five blankets on my bed, trying not to freeze to death because the wind was just coming right through the walls. I mean, it was crazy. That does not uh, it was, that a, it was an experience. <laughs> that is the that is the exact term I would probably use. About. <laughs> so, um, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, Endor, which kind of sounds like a something out of Star Wars, but it's actually in the Nebraska <laughs> Department of Roads. Uh, how are the roads within the state for the most part? Uh, there, for the most part, the main thoroughfares are very well kept. Um, okay. Once you get off the beaten, once you get off 
the main roads and you know get to the back roads in country you will find gravel roads you will find dirt roads um, most of the cities are all paved and you know obviously highways connect them and intersect them but once you're off the beaten path then you, you're going to find the roads are kind of rough they can be you know and if you go out to western uh nebraska and the sand hills and stuff like that just don't even look for pavement it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> take your four by with you <laughs> pretty much i mean yeah i mean there there are obviously state parks and things like that and they're they make sure that traffic could get to and from it but uh, but for the most part uh, they they do a really good job with their roads i mean there's always something going on in the interstates that they're fixing and doing stuff the cities themselves have little pothole problems and every city does but but do they have the enough part, do they have enough snow plows for the winter time or is it primarily oh, okay that's yeah. the problem that's the problem is the snow plows they hit the concrete little cracks things like that and just tears them up Oh, yeah, that would make sense. Uh, then in terms of major airports, I imagine most of the cities like Lincoln and, uh, you know, uh, Omaha, they would probably have like the larger airports within those areas. Uh, but in terms of ports, even though it's a landlocked location, you still have the river that goes through Nebraska, correct? Yeah, yeah there's the Niobrara, there's the Platte River, but the big uh, barge traffic and pleasure boat traffic is the Missouri. And there's a lot of lot of traffic that takes place, believe it or not, on the Missouri. Mm -hmm. And the rail, the rail traffic there is too, because the Union oh, yeah. Pacific is located in Omaha and they run all throughout Nebraska. So there's a lot of trains that come and go through the system. And you know, it's just a kind of a way of life. When I when I lived in uh, Lincoln, I would get waking up sometimes in the middle of the night by the trains blaring their horns because they're coming through the city. You know, <laughs> you know, between between the tornadoes, the cold weather, and the trains, I don't. You're not really <laughs> selling me on this whole Nebraska. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> it's just um, you got to know the parts of town. You yeah. have to know the parts of town, as with any place, though. You know, that's true. Um, and then in terms of tourism, like, what is the biggest tourist draw for Nebraska? Like, why would I want to go there for tourism purposes? Well, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of nature. Um, nature travel there there's stargazing travel um there's also like natural um things have you ever heard of carhenge i have not tell me a little bit about that so carhenge is a a, a a tourist attraction site where they have erected cars spray painted them white and they have arranged them to look like stonehenge but it's all cars sticking into the ground and stacked on top of each other and it, it's it's an attraction site. Carhenge, got it. <laughs> Carhenge, yeah. You'll, it's it's a, it's something to see. That's for sure. Uh, and the, na the natural parks that are in the area. Um. Yeah. There's the, there's Niobrara, and by the way, Niobrara is actually a very big summertime attraction. If people go rafting, they'll go up there. They'll get on the Niobrara, and they can raft for hours, hours. Like and and it's just relaxing, you know. Well, it yeah, sounds like a nature's paradise in the area there. So that sounds oh, really, really absolutely, nice. Absolutely. And there's lakes too all over the place. A lot of people believe it because of the low cost of living there. A lot of people have boats. They have jet skis. They have things of that stuff to go have fun. You know, sounds fun. Now let's talk about, and again, I don't like to get in a lot of politics uh, during the podcast or in during the, or during the vlog. Um, but for the most part, you know, let's just talk about what the setup is in terms of the political structure of the state. So the state primarily, at least right now is conservative. Um, mm -hmm. And for the, and there is some blue spots within the area, uh, primarily the larger cities of Omaha and, and Lincoln, but not a huge overwhelming amount of uh, liberal uh, traffic within the within the state. It's 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 a good mix. I would start to say of some of that uh, where you get primarily uh, conservative, but there is a little bit of a smattering of democratic politics as well. And then you were also mentioning that there's some independent uh, traffic as well in the area too. Correct. Absolutely. And see, that's one of the things is every time that like there's uh, a big election and they talk about it like, oh, you know, Nebraska is solidly red, this, that and the other. And it's true. They do lean conservative. However, there's a huge track record for centralists. They want they want they lean conservative, but they lean center conservative, not right wing conservative. Mm -hmm. Same with the Democrats. They, they don't lean left wing. So you will, you will never see a progressive in office there. What you would see is a central Dem guy like Ben Sasse, you know, uh, a former senator there. He was one of the most conservative Democrats uh, in the Senate because of that centralist 
feeling of that's the way that they've kind of grown that way you know it's that they want to be seen as not like right wing or left wing it's it's like if you don't meet in the middle how can you get anything done and so that's how they get things done Mm, excellent and then in terms of natural resources within the state, um, obviously oil, natural gas, those are two big ones. What, what else am I leaving off this list? What are some of the other natural resources or things that maybe the state are known for? Beef. Beef. <laughs> <laughs> lots of cow. There's, a, there's lots of cow. There's lots of uh, pig farms. There's lots of chicken farms. Uh, farming is a big uh, commodity there. And it's not just corn. You know, a lot of people think, oh, you know, uh, agricultural, it's an agricultural state, but there's a lot of other things, like you said, that's going on there. Um, There's a lot of water reserves there. There's a lot of um, some oil reserves and uh, natural gas and things of that nature. And and the pipeline that's coming through that, that uh, is kind of deadlocked, you know. That's the tar sands pipeline? Yeah. 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 You were making mention to me though about the underwater aquifer that's in the area as well too? Absolutely. The Ogallala, the Ogallala Water Reserve. And it's one of the largest, I believe it is the largest underground freshwater sea in all of the United States. And it sits right underneath Nebraska and Kansas and um, parts of uh, Iowa. So it, and it literally all the water melt off from the Rockies come down this way, hit the rivers and then soak their way into the ground, into this aquifer underneath the ground. Okay. And it's a, it's, it's really a, a interesting thing, you know, because it feeds all the lakes that are in the area. Cause there are quite a few lakes in Nebraska and, uh, and it, it's a, it's quite a natural wonder, believe it or not, because it's such a large sea that's under, it is a sea. It's described as a sea. And it's refilling itself because of the water generated from the Rocky mountains and the, the runoff and, from that and runoff and rain and, you know, everything else. And, you know, when droughts happen and they do happen, you start to see that reserve lowering by watching the lakes, the lakes will start to recede and they get lower and lower and lower. And I witnessed that actually one of my, one of my last years there is there was a, there was a big drought. We weren't getting as much runoff from the Rockies and, um, some of the lakes that were in and around the city all almost disappeared because they were just. I was going to ask, actually, are there any concerns? Because like here where I live in Fountain Valley, there's artesian wells or there were artesian wells at one point that they've been for the most part drained. But when you have something like an under an underground sea, I mean, does that does that cause a concern for things like sinkholes or anything like that or saturation of the land? I think it has to do with tectonic plates, that the plates that are in place there, that it is really, there's no chance of that happening because of the, the way it's structured, um, okay. the, the way the aquifer is created. There might be weak points, and that would probably be where the lakes formed, is what I would guess, um, because it's, it's an old sea. It's not something recent. Um, but usually, when it's running up against the Rocky Mountains, it's, that's the area where it's flowing into then. Exactly, exactly. So if it was something new that just carved out a space, then I would worry about sinkholes because yeah. then the ground's not ready for that and it falls in. But this has been there for uh, <laughs> maybe millions of years. I mean, it's it's a natural wonder. For sure. Excellent. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, what about in terms of education? It sounds like we have a number of different major colleges there. Um, University of Nebraska, obviously. Um, uh, Creighton, Creighton, is it Creighton? Creighton? Creighton. Creighton. Creighton, U- Creighton University. Yeah, Creighton, the, the Blue Jays. They and are then, they are Catholic school. Yes. Okay. And then of course Peru State uh, College has been there since the mid 1800s, just about, or a little yes. after that. Um, mm-hmm. Any other ones that, I've, that I'm missing there? Uh, there are. Uh, unfortunately, um, when my time was there, there were a number of colleges that actually went under or were um, or were absorbed. <laughs> by the University of Nebraska or the other because of failing uh, attendance numbers, failing uh, grants, um, donors, you know, people that have been donating for, donating for a long time, they're, they're, the foundation pulled out for whatever reason. Um, but the biggest one obviously is the University of Nebraska and they they're, have a presence just about everywhere. Um, they have campuses, multiple campuses, and they, they Pretty much, if you are a Nebraskan, you to be seen as a Nebraskan, you kind of have to go and get educated by the University of Nebraska. I mean, it's it's just kind of the thing to do, you know. Are they and primarily known? 
Yeah, I was gonna say, are they primarily known for a very specific kind of degree? Like, was, like what is the big one that, that a lot of people go there for? No, oh, they go there for all different things. They would go there for agri agriculture, um, obviously is a big one, but there's business, there's uh, law school, there's medical. In fact, the uh, University of Nebraska Medical Center is located in Omaha, Nebraska, and that's uh, they're doing work right now on the COVID virus, you know, on ep ed 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 etymology or etymology exactly etymology, yeah exactly so they're studying what's going on with covid right now and and uh and then i got my degree there i mean i got my degree in film and new media production so Excellent. you know uh they have a very very wide diverse um education system there they have a very strong liberal arts program they have very strong language programs and also um travel programs you know because mm. you can actually study abroad my my best friend who he studied in Germany for like two years and that's how I got to travel to Germany to visit him and visit another friend in in Slovenia, you know, traveling through trains through the European cities because of his connection to that program. Very University. cool. Excellent. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then in terms of safety and security within the state of Nebraska, no major real crimes that are that are perpetuated. But I mean, there is obviously to college towns, which means there are some nuisance type of things that will happen from time to time within those areas. Yeah, um, absolutely. The biggest, the biggest concern generally in Nebraska is the I-80 corridor, and that is a known drug trafficking corridor. There's a lot of drug traffic that flows through I-80 going from the East Coast to the West Coast or vice versa. And Omaha just happens to be a waypoint in that traffic. So that means that there are gangs. There are gangs that are in Omaha, and there are wannabe gangs that are in Lincoln. Um, well, I shouldn't say wannabe because they are can be violent, um, but most of the crimes are going to be centered in the in the cities. Like you don't see too much crime out in the rural areas, um, and it's just a fact of life. I mean, that's just how it is. The more commerce you get, the more crime you're going to find. Yeah, I think that's a lot with with a lot of major population centers that are everywhere in the world. Um, and also well, poverty, poverty levels too. I mean. That's true. That's true. Um, and just like one last thing really quick. Um, let's just do like a quick snapshot. Let's say I have a round trip ticket from LAX to Omaha or somewhere specific in Nebraska, maybe Lincoln. Like sell me on why I would want to go there. What, what's, what's your one minute speech on why I would want to go and maybe take a trip to Nebraska? Well, I mean, uh, for one thing, you could go and see the uh, World Series, College World Series that takes oh, place yeah. there every year, every summer. Um, College Baseball World, that's the epicenter of the baseball universe. And it happens to be right next to the Henry Durley Zoo, which is one of the biggest zoos in all of the United States. It is a hmm. fantastic zoo. It's great. I mean, they're, they've got all sorts of displays, interactivity, they got desert domes, they got different biomes that you could go visit. Uh, it, it's an awesome zoo. And then the people there, honestly, some of the nicest people I have ever met in my entire life have been in Nebraska, you know, and I've lived on the East coast now, and I've, I have lived on the West coast and I've met nice people there, but you just don't see people that just stop and help you. Like a good example of that is, uh, I didn't know how to drive on ice when I first moved there and I got stuck on the side of the road. My tires were spinning and I was stuck. These kids coming back from a concert, just call behind me and goes, Hey, you need some help. They sat on the back of my car until I got traction to go. <laughs> I could not see that happening in in california or in the east coast it's just the people there are just they'll stop at a whim and be like hey you need some help are you okay what can i do for you they would give you the shirt off their back the nicest kindest people you will ever meet ours is in nebraska i kid you not i i believe you man so again it's been a real pleasure talking with you all thank you so much again for Absolutely. taking the time to speak with me this has been a real treasure and again <laughs> don't be a stranger uh <laughs> yeah. hey hey you too man i i'm uh, i'm interested in your travels and uh, hopefully uh once all this whole pandemic thing goes away you'll be able to get out there more and start to go see other places and and uh and see where where your travels take you because i agree uh, it, yeah. it's important i i really do feel that we're so insular as a as a society that we really need to see what other people think and feel and experience and the only way to do that is to travel 
I agree, one hundred percent. You got you've got it down to a science. So thank you so much, my friend. And uh, again, to my students that are out there, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to send them to Scott at theprofessortravel.com. If you're on YouTube and you want to know when new videos go up, hit that bell icon right above us in order to be notified about when those new videos are available to you. Yep, exactly. Uh, if you haven't already subscribed, please feel free to do so. It doesn't cost you anything and it does help us out. And then finally, if you like this content and you want to see more of it, give us the likes button. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Smash that thing. Um, if you're on the podcast, however, and uh, we always appreciate it, uh, feel free to rate us, review us. We always appreciate the feedback. So until next time, my name is Scott. I am the Professor Travel and make every day a travel adventure. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye now.